So thank you, John. Uh, John is in many ways my teacher, uh, my, the man who radicalized me in many areas of life. I thought I was a, an extremist until I met him. And then <laughs> now I feel like a moderate, you know, like whatever. OK, so I, what I'd like to talk about is some, something that people don't often talk about in this, fa in this space, which is Bitcoin as a monetary technology, uh, by which I mean a replacement for national monetary policy. Uh, it's a little bit of a strange topic because y you have to understand that like five years ago, nobody would have imagined that anybody would even be talking like this. It was inconceivable that there'd be something that would emerge from the market economy itself that would actually challenge uh, the government monopoly over money, which we've taken for granted for a very long time. A hundred years of monetary socialism or monetary nationalism that's been unimpeded. Uh, we don't really know what it's like to have a market in the production of money itself. This is a rather important subject because, you know, as the cliche goes, money constitutes half of every economic transaction. It does become an important matter if all governments in the world basically control half of all, all uh, economic exchanges by default, by ownership. And it's a little strange how we've sort of gotten used to this. And I understand why. You know, it's been so long since we've ever experienced anything like a market. Most of us have no knowledge of or understanding of how it would actually work. The widespread presumption in all economics literature and in all of policy life is that the government controls the money. I mean, that's, that's the way it's always been. I mean, it's been that way for more or less hundreds of years, but especially for the last 100 years. So there has arisen around the issue of national money a gigantic scientific apparatus, right? So we have dozens of journals dedicated to monetary policy and banking policy and monetary science and the science of central planning with the money. Uh, thousands of economists employed uh, by the Fed alone, but uh, in the Treasury Department, uh, monetary economists teaching all, uh, universities all over the, all over the world. You know, none of which existed in the 19th century. You have to understand. I mean, this, this whole notion that you can centrally plan a monetary policy using high-level science uh, was not, you know, something anybody considered in the 19th century. In the 19th century, monetary debates were basically, you know, is, your, is your money going to be sound and solid uh, based in, in, in commodity and real, or is it going to be corrupt and inflationary and therefore leading to booms and busts and fueling rackets and mercantilism and all this kind of stuff. This is basically the debate. It was a, a debate over, you know, um, morality more than anything else, really. Uh, corruption meant paper money, um, and uh, uh, soundness and, and freedom meant, meant commodity money. Then suddenly, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, we got this thing called the Federal Reserve. Now, it just so happened that the Federal Reserve nationalized money, basically. It could have happened to any good. So you, you might think about this for a second. Let's say, for example, that there was a, a, a very uh, large shoe industry in the late 19th century that kept finding itself in a whole series of financial crises and basically lobbied the federal government at some point to create uh, a national shoe uh, policy with the national shoe repositories and with like the shoes were too big to fail or what, I don't know what but <laughs> but but you had a policy surrounding this and all private productions of shoes just kind of went away and everybody who made shoes you know had to had to register they had to be approved they had to be part of some big grand project they had to be part of the national uh, ethos um, it became very important to the country what kind of shoes we wore, and a whole scientific establishment sort of grew up around national shoe policy. I mean, this would, this would happen. It would happen if the government had taken over the shoe industry in the same way that it's happened uh, to money. And after a while, everybody would forget how shoes were, could ever be managed by the market. Anybody who suggested such a thing would be, cons would be considered completely crazy and, until maybe one you know, one guy makes a, you know, a, a private shoe and he holds it up to the world and says, well, here's how I made it and gave the instructions to everybody and gradually over five years, you know, everything kind of lost control and pretty soon, you know, the national shoe industry, you know, is under, under strain. That's basically what we're seeing today with money. So, um, but when the Fed was created, there was essentially, there were two levels to the Fed. Uh, there was on one hand the scientific gloss, the claim that 
Uh, only by national monetary management will we be able to get unemployment under control, inflation under control, calm down business cycles. In the problem of wildcat banking, bring stability and rationality to the sector. Uh, and and all this was this is the scientific rationale. On the other hand, there's an underlying reality that was really going on uh, with the creation of the Fed, which was basically that. A, a banking industry that had been constantly under threat, under fire, because it had um, uh, was always faced with insolvency because it was overexpanding beyond a point at which could I, it could be sustained by the markets. So it was always involved in you know government rackets and, and cooperating with governments buying their debts and inflating on top of those government debts using it as assets, and then then inflation would turn into a business cycle, and then there, there'd be runs on the bank. Well, the banks were tired of this, right? So. Um, Throughout the late 19th century, we saw ever more consolidation in the banking industry. And then finally, in 1907, was the last straw. There's a big panic. Uh, a lot of depositors lost their money. The banks went to the government, and basically, a big deal was, was made. A, a big uh, uh, cooperative uh, uh, racket was pulled off, where essentially the banking industry agreed to fund the government's projects forever, in exchange for which it would be, uh, get uh, uh, bailout guarantees from the government and also crush banking competition. This is a big factor here in the creation of the Fed. The major big players in the industry uh, put together a regulatory system to squeeze out the smaller players and not have to face that kind of banking competition. So that was the, that was the whole idea of the Federal Reserve. So you have, on one hand, a scientific rationale for the thing, and then on the other hand, an underlying reality, which is basically the usual scams that government's always running. You know, so, and that's the way it's existed ever since. So, there were three big phases in the 20th century to this great monetary nationalist experiment. Now, of course, private currency just went away throughout the 20th century. I mean, even in the late 19th century, there's evidence that there was still private creation of money here and there. But this came to an end in the 20th century. And uh, one of the big trends we saw from 1913 all the way up to the end of the 20th century was the elimination of all commodity backing. I mean, what started off as being more or less a gold standard, you know, ended at the end of the day with just a big paper money system uh, with unlimited supply creation and unlimited ability of government to use uh, money to, to fund itself. So we saw, we saw uh, monetary policy take place in three great phases in the 20th century. The first one was the deployment stage, where the central bank was used what, for what it was intended for, uh, namely to fund a massive expansion of government beyond which governments could ever tax their citizens. I mean, you understand, if there hadn't been a Fed, the US never would have entered into World War I. I mean, there's no chance. Uh, that would have never happened. In fact, if there hadn't been a German central bank, uh, there would have been no uh, war in Europe either. I mean, governments simply cannot tax their citizens that much. People get angry and they revolt. So central banks actually free governments from ha the burden of having to collect taxes from their citizens. So that was the very first great way that uh, the central bank was used, was to kill people, basically, yeah. and draft people, and to run a big central plan and jail people who disagreed, uh, to set prices, to vastly expand the public sector at the expense of human freedom. That was the very first use of the Federal Reserve. That's, that's what it did, and that's what it was for. And then we saw, um, during, from between the period of 1913 and sort of 1920, a gigantic expansion of government in other areas, you know, whether it's antitrust policy, uh, the first creation of the public sector welfare states, huge expansion of, of public schooling and uh, educational funding, uh, consolidation of a global empire. All these things were made possible solely by the existence of, of the central bank. This is the great consolidation period run scientifically, right? Well, did it work? Not really. I mean, there were continued to be uh, ever more waves of, inf of inflation, uh, deflation, business cycles, uh, instabilities. It didn't get rid of those things at all, but it did actually make the expansion of government possible and the consolidation of the industry assured, protected against con competition. The whole experiment uh, came crashing down in 1929. After a decade of unrelenting uh, expansion of money, it's a very interesting thing when Satoshi Nakamoto set up to create Bitcoin. I mean, what was this great contribution, right? I mean, what was the great innovation of Bitcoin? It solved the problem of double spending, right? You have to solve that problem. Well, 
Governments don't consider this a problem, actually. <laughs> Double spend is the essence of monetary policy, you know? That's the way it works, right? Satoshi knew that he had to solve the problem or else nobody would ever accept a Bitcoin. I and mean, governments don't face this problem. You know, this is, the, the essence of monetary policy is double spending for them. It's the, the ability to create infinite amounts of, of currency. Okay, the system broke down in 1929. And so how do did, how did governments respond to this? Well, first there was a Hoover administration um, which attempted to bail out the banks and massively lower interest rates and inflate the economy. The problem was, and, and FDR faced that same, the same problem, there was such a massive debt over, overhang, it was not possible to, for the Federal Reserve to inflate. They kept trying and trying and trying. There's a little bit of a myth out there that Hoover was negligent, you know, and that we inadvertently let the banks fail when we should have bailed them out. The Great Depression says, no, that's true, actually. They tried desperately to bail out the whole system, but the debt overhang was so extreme. The de pressure for de deleveraging was so intense, there was nothing the central bank could do, it about, do about it. So monetary policy completely failed. What did FDR do, finally? Well, he, uh, uh, declared a banking holiday and collected everybody's gold. It's unbelievable, actually. Yeah, yeah. Basically made private ownership of, of gold illegal and uh, depreciated the money. You know, so just reset it back. It robbed everybody in the country. I mean, this was the great failure of central banking. It wasn't the failure of capitalism. I mean, it was the ultimate failure of central banking. It stopped working at that point in history. Um, you have to fast forward now through I mean, it's very strange to me that people think that this somehow got us out of the Depression. Well, the Depression lasted for like 10 years until the next thing you know, we're slaughtering people again in World War II, thanks again to the Central Bank, not, none of which would have happened without the Fed. So this is, you know, a dramatic failure. This was not anybody's success of central banking. This was, this is a period of consolidation of central banking, but it represented a calamitous failure. After World War II, um, we saw the, uh, Keynesian economics. Now, the Keynesians who had learned their um, uh, monetary policy as studying uh, under the under the uh, John Maynard Keynes' general theory, you know, had a view that monetary policy could be used for just a lot more than just consolidating a banking industry or um, uh, funding wars or uh, stabilizing the economy or anything like that. I mean, what Keynes imagined monetary policy would do it was that it would work together with fiscal policy to create a massive apparatus of macroeconomic planning so that we could guarantee certain high rates of growth. Uh, we could carefully calibrate the difference between unemployment and inflation. Uh, it was just like one gigantic lever that lived uh, at the Federal Reserve in Washington. You would pull it this way, you would pull it that way. You had to hire the right experts. Ideally, this would happen on a global level, and this is what they did after World War II. You know, uh, all the uh, Keynes and, and, and all of the, the Keynesians from all over the world got together with all the statesmen and the treasury officials, and they cobbled together a new monetary system called the Britain Woods system, which is supposed to be the ultimate answers, the great scientific answers. We've been hearing this for a century, you know that, oh, now we have the ultimate scientific answer to the money problem. Now, every time they come up with a new system and every time it's failed. Well, this th whole system fell apart in the late 1960s. Once, um, once again, governments expanded the uh, money supply too much and expanded their, their spending too much. The debt overhang became too intense. The gold outflows became extreme to the point that uh, Richard Nixon had to shut the gold window. This represented the fi final failure of the whole monetary policy system. The whole thing had finally unraveled. The system they cobbled together in 1913 was basically dead by 1973. So what's been happening since 1973? Well, this was, this is the complete unraveling. This is, this has been the period in which monetary policy completely stopped working. And there's several things that are very important here for you to understand. Uh, one is that by the mid-1970s, the Keynesian system stopped working, right? We were never supposed to have inflation and unemployment at the same time. We did. Okay, so that it just you know, refutes Keynesianism on the face of it. Then we saw a massive, high, basically, you know, a very high inflation, almost hyperinflation in the late 1970s that gutted all the capital stock of, and savings of, of Americans. Uh, it was a, a wholesale looting uh, of, of um, property uh, in the late 1970s. Uh, inflation got up finally to 13%. Uh, if price controls weren't able to control it, this is a final concession. Richard Nixon's great new solution did not work. By 1981, in the early 1980s, we got a thing called financial deregulation, at which point monetary policy ceased to work at all. 
the Fed hasn't really been able to control the national money supply since uh, the early 1980s at all. I mean, they push buttons, they try to do things. We've seen this over the last five years, right? I mean, the Fed has been desperately trying to uh, generate an inflation. It's been unable to do it. It's tried to generate economic growth by driving interest rates to zero. It's been unable to do it. Uh, there's very little part of the money supply the Fed can even control. It can't even count anymore how much money there is. There, nobody really knows. Try to figure out, like, how many dollars are there? I mean, the Fed has so many different measures. You know, and about every six months, they get rid of one and introduce another. You know, so it's, it's, it's anybody's guess. I mean, the system is essentially so broken that it no longer has the plausibility of science to it anymore. And what's fascinating to me is that just the way in which this national mon monetary system has so corrupted the intellectual class. It's like people stopped imagining the possibility that markets could manage money. I mean, like, nobody really thought of this. As far as I can tell, I mean, not, I mean we, know, we know that the monetarists, you know, imagine an ideal system where money would expand 3% a year or something like that. Well, you can't do that when you don't even know how much money there is and you don't have the mechanisms of control to expand or shrink. You don't have those things anymore and you haven't since the early 1980s. That whole plan is busted. We know that Keynesianism is completely busted. That never really works in the first place, but it's just completely implausible when, when you have no mechanisms whatsoever and the mechanisms you think you do have don't work. But even the Austrians, you know, they're the great com competitor to the Keynesians and the uh, monetarists themselves, <coughs> you know, were routinely asked, well, what would you do if you were in charge? Well, we would institute a gold standard. We would expand it, you know, based on the profitability of gold mining. Uh, we would have 100% reserves, and maybe we would have free banking, or whatever. You know, a whole series of plans that the Austrians themselves imagined that they had for how to manage national money under a kind of a, a sound money system. Well, what hardly anybody imagined, and I would make one exception here for F.A. Hayek, because as far as I can tell, he's the only one that really imagined such a thing as Bitcoin ever existing. Uh, nobody imagined that the system would, uh, could actually be recreated from the bottom up. So what have we learned? I mean, think about what happened. And let me just quickly tell the story of, of um, where Bitcoin came from, just so that I mean, as often as, as I've told the story, people are always surprised to learn. So what happened was in 2008, uh, because house prices were under pressure and the whole shadow banking system, which has actually emerged since the early 1980s, which is far vaster, much bigger than the official banking system, but was so highly leveraged with mortgage-backed securities uh, that their, all their models turned upside down you know, um, all the largest security firms in the United States, uh, threatening to topple the entire system. Now, how bad was it? How close were we to ruin in 2008? I don't really know for sure, but at the time, the president was um, George Bush, right? George W. Bush, <laughs> right? And, and he, he, uh, he basically told everybody, look, we've got to have this, this hundreds of billion dollar bailout, bailout with TARP, or, or it's, it's going to be a disaster. You're going to go to your cash machine and not get any cash. You're, 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 there's not going to be any coming out. You're going to go to the grocery store, and probably the shelves are going to be completely empty. Ships will not be able to leave their, their harbors because they won't be able to get the bonded insurance. Essentially, you're, everything about our lives is at stake here. We've got to have this gigantic bailout. Well. This is a weird kind of system. I mean, after a century of scientific planning and monetary policy, for house prices to fall, you know, 10, 20 percent and threaten the entire global monetary financial system? I mean, this is not a very robust system here, right? This is not a very good way to go about things. So Satoshi, what he did was, you know, he's watching this whole thing uh, take place and thought, well, heck, <clears throat> let's just reinvent money for the digital age in a way that's sound and solid and replicates something like the old-fashioned gold standard, and which is essentially what Bitcoin is. Now, this immediately poses a problem for anybody schooled in monetary economics. And this is, I guess, to me, what's so interesting about Bitcoin, is what it's taught us. I mean, we thought we knew, but we didn't really know. So what he showed was 
is that it was possible to generate a money, a sound money, out of computer code provided the protocol was beautifully structured. We had previously believed that money always had to emerge out of a commodity system, a system of barter. This is why I was initially so skeptical of Bitcoin. I mean, I didn't believe it could, it could actually be true because I had always thought that money had to emerge out of barter exchange. I mean, this is, lots of people claim that this was what Ludwig von Mises himself taught in his great book, Theory of Money and Credit from 1912, the great monetary treatise, right, that uh, warned against central banking. So how did it come to be that, that Bitcoin obtained its first value? Well, let's just say that instead of emerging out of commodity exchange, the money value of the uh, payment, uh, the money, the monetary value of the unit of exchange came not out of a commodity but out of a service. And what is that service? In the case of Bitcoin, it's just a beautiful and elegant payment system, which is exactly how it was introduced into the world. I mean, the white paper comes out in what? Uh, October, uh, the first, uh, the Genesis block emerges in the first week of, of January. Um, what's its value? Uh, what's the value of the unit of exchange uh, when it first uh, goes out into the market? It, it introduced into a free forum. Anybody can download it, anybody can look at it. Uh, the Senate Banking Committee never gave permission for this. Nobody asked Ben Bernanke. It was never discussed in the economics journals. The Journal of Monetary Economics never had an article about it. It was just thrown out in a free forum. And what was the value of the currency? It was zero, right? Nothing. But eight months went by when people were able to play with the system. And what were they playing with? They're playing with the blockchain, playing with the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system of exchanging property titles back and forth. And over the course of eight months, people gradually discovered that it worked. And that's kind of amazing. So that began the process of the valuation of Bitcoin. The so Bitcoin becomes the unit of account to um, for the deployment of this great, great payment system. In other words, what I'm arguing here is that the basis of Bitcoin's value itself is in the blockchain. It's in the payment system. It's not that Bitcoin as a unit somehow, you know, has its own independent value. If you could somehow subtract Bitcoin away from the blockchain and the peer-to-peer -peer system and, and the distributed network, it would be as valueless as any other computer code. It doesn't mean, it would not mean anything. So its value, its commodity value, as it were, is really a service value. It's the blockchain itself. Now, this is an incredible revelation to anybody who studied modern economics. What it basically does is it blows up a century of monetary theory. You know, it just blows it up. I mean, you can't read anything written over the last hundred years on the subject, with the exception of one essay by F. A. Hayek, that makes any sense of Bitcoin. That's an amazing thing. That's how revolutionary this is. And the superiority of it, you know, I mean, you only have to use it one time to suddenly realize, oh my God, you know, what have we been missing? What we've been missing is the forces of markets and competitions and private enterprise and creativity and genius uh, applied to the realm of money. This is essentially what happens when you put governments in charge of anything. As I said, you could do it with shoes, you could do it with carrots, whatever you put government in charge of for 100 years is going to be pretty crappy after 100 years. It's going to be terrible. And that's essentially what happened. So one of the reasons all of us in this room are amazed by what we're seeing, it's not that Bitcoin itself is sort of unnaturally incredible. It's just that it's the first real attempt to put an end to a static, government-controlled, overly bureaucratized, hacked, hacked, hacked system that has stopped working for the modern age. I mean, the dollar is the equivalent of you know, a car from 1913 or a telephone from 1913. It would be like if we still um, had, had the same kinds of methods of food production from 1913. I mean, it's a thrown back, reactionary, anachronism that never kept, kept, kept with the times. And that's why Bitcoin is so amazing to us. I mean, we're, we're, it's like we've been asleep for 100 years and we've woken, woken up to new realities. I mean, Bitcoin's probably not any more amazing than a cell phone or the internet or, or email or Google chat or anything else. It's just that it's applied to money. And it's blowing our minds <laughs> because we've not been allowed to see what markets could do. So what has it taught us? 
well, as I say, has taught us that almost everything we thought we knew was wrong. And I'd like to see a little bit of humility on the part of economists, actually, <laughs> every once in a while, a lot of this. You know, sometimes you have to look out the window, get your head out of the books, and actually learn from what's going on out there. And I, I, I think this applies not just to Paul Krugman, uh, but to, you know, <laughs> you know, but also to, to there are many, many people uh, who are friends of mine who uh, imagine themselves to be free market economists who still maintain that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, it can't be true, it's all, it's all a lie, it's, you know. So these arguments, I mean, I, I was just at the Bitcoin Center in New York and had a nice debate with uh, my friend Andrew Schiff, you know, over this whole subject and who continues to be very confused uh, by it. And I understand why people ask questions about Bitcoin. I mean, it's a complicated technology. I mean, what does it require that you understand? If you want to understand, you don't have to understand it really, but if you want to understand it, you have to understand something about cryptography, monetary theory, peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer networks, distributed networks, open source software development. There's a lot that has to go into trying to figure it out, right? I mean, it's a little bit complicated. But, you know, electricity is complicated. And we don't have to think about that every time we come into a room and turn on the lights, right? So that's where we're headed towards. That's where I think the future is going to be. People are not going to have to worry about all the complicated technology that obsesses us in this room. We're just going to use it as a regular currency. Um, let me just finish up with some final speculations on, on the future here because uh, it's a little confusing. We've never actually lived through any period in which national monies are replaced by a globally viable cryptocurrency you know, generated through, through uh, distributed networks. I mean, we don't actually know anything about the subject. There's really no historical precedent for it. But I would suggest that we all need to prepare ourselves for a great deal of upheaval. Um, uh, things like what happened the other day with Mt. Gox, it's just the beginning. We're going to see ever more of this. And if governments get heavily involved <coughs> in the regulation of Bitcoin, it's going to get way worse. I mean, there will always be private scams and private scandals and, and, and businesses that come and go. It's true in the railroad industry, too, when railroads came along. But if governments get overly involved in the Bitcoin space, it's going to be, you know, the corruption you will never, you know, is going to make Mt. Gox like, Mt. Gox look like just the beginning. I mean, this is what happened in the railroad industry. I mean, government got involved in railroads to stop the, uh, the problems of late trains and and exploitation of workers and badly built bridges and, and these kinds of things. And you know, the result of government involvement in the railroad, uh, railroad industry was the worst corruption we ever saw you know, in the whole uh, of the 19th century. So this is definitely what's going to happen if government gets overly involved. But even if it stays out, we're going to continue to see firms come and firms go. Don't panic. Um, you know, everybody I knew in the Bitcoin space knew the Mt. Gox was a disaster. I mean, people were warning against it for two years. I myself, you know, in all my writings about the subject, warned people to stay away from this company. Uh, we couldn't wait for it to go away, you know. Uh, I have no animus towards these nice people, but, you know, it was, it was just badly run and had been for a couple of years, and every, or three years or four years, and everybody kind of knew that. So we'll see more of this kind of stuff. At the same, same time, we're going to see continuing rates of adoption. It's going to be incredible. I mean, even at this event, when you look at the number of vendors that are displaying here, I mean, most of these people didn't even exist 12 months ago. I mean, the infrastructure growing up around Bitcoin is exploding uh, at a pace that's just, just beyond belief. As I say, history has been on hold for 100 years, and it's just now blasting open. We're starting to see uh, what's possible. So in the future, I mean, we're definitely going to see parallel monetary systems um, emerging. Uh, one, a crypto monetary system. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm not annoyed by altcoins at all. I had a nice debate with my friend Dan Daniel Krawitz the other day. He's a Bitcoin patriot, whereas I'm a big fan of, you know, every kind of quirky coin you can name. I like them all. Uh, I have no problems with any of those things. Um, we're not only going to see parallel currency systems, crypto, cryptocurrency existing side by side with national currencies in every country in the world, but we're also going to see continuing parallel systems within the crypt, cryptocurrency world. Uh, we already see there's 10,000 altcoins existing. Uh, they'll continue to rise and fall. There will be pump and dump schemes. There will be you know, scams all over the place. People are going to lose their shirts. It's going to be monetary competition. On the other hand, it's going to be very good for Bitcoin and for whatever coin is going to 
to lead the pack because we've now got an alpha beta staging live system of testing and can gradual improvement on money. Imagine that, a money that actually gets better over time. You know, who can believe such a, such a thing? I mean, um, yeah, I'm getting the signal here, but let me just finish with something else. The implications of, of cryptocurrency for the culture and our society and for the economy are gigantic. We have all been shaped, our sensibilities, our economic behaviors with, by the age of inflation. We always expect our money to be worth less and less and less in the future. We have a propensity to spend, uh, to live in a state of debt all the time. Uh, that's the way we've been socialized. We've been socialized that way because our money is bad. It's made us overvalue material things and undervalue savings. I mean, people don't save anymore. Interest rates are zero. We're not rewarded for saving. So we live like assholes most of the time. <laughs> actually. It's, 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 this, is what central, this, this is what central bank, banking has done to us, you know? So it's changed our culture and changed us as people. So if we start using cryptocurrency, it's going to change everything. I, I, when I say this, there will be some people in this room that will know exactly what I mean. You're holding on to Bitcoin, and you're in a position to spend it. You are very careful about how you use that, aren't you? Oh, yes. Yeah. It changes, it changes the way you look at the material world. You're looking around your house. you got a house full of stuff everywhere. Every once in a while you sit down in your chair and you think, what if I sold all this for Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a smart thing. I mean, it happens, right? You think this way. So it changes, the, it changes our psychology. What it's going to do is cause us as a people and a culture to start thinking ever more long term. For the first time, like in generations, we're going to be start thinking about the future. And that's an amazing thing. And what's that going to do to us economically? From an economics point of view, it means that we're going to start accumulating capital again. And capital is the basis for long-term economic planning, uh, the expansion of the division of labor, and the expansion of prosperity itself. I mean, the end of the age of inflation taking place within the cryptography world is going to change us as people and restore prosperity, not just here but around the world. Now, what about the parallel standards? Americans are freaked out by, th by this idea that we'd have two currencies uh, circulating simultaneously. We're the only people in the world that think this way. Most everybody else in the world is very happy to use two, three, four, five currencies uh, in one space. And um, it's true that Americans are pretty stupid about math, but actually I think that <laughs> that we can, we can actually adapt to the system. It's going to take some, some uh, struggle. Americans are totally freaked out by it. But uh, we can do this. We can do this. So what will dollars be used for in the future, if not for the daily use of consumer spending and stuff like that? Well, dollars will be useful for collecting taxes. That's for sure. Uh, dollars will be continued to use, be useful for shoring up the uh, banking system that's going to be continued to be under, under pressure um, and, and, and unstable. That's what I, I believe we're looking at over the next uh, 25 years or so. And let me open it up to questions now. Go ahead. Yeah, right here. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Awesome and entertaining as always. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, that last point that you touched on yeah. about uh, the dollar's use for taxes yeah. uh, brings up a point about modern money theory. Uh, which a lot of uh, modern money theory makes sense to me, especially with respect to uh, currency being used as debt. How does Bitcoin fit into that? Is it, um, yeah. does it contradict it, or is there uh, a place so for it? So Bitcoin is, is r completely unlike national money in that it's actually real property. I mean, the, the most amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it's something that I uh, own or you own, and there can't be anything in between uh, there. And money is not like that at, at all. There's a, a, a national money. Now, there's a great deal of ambiguity <laughs> with the national money. Like, nobody actually knows how much you own. I was just in the bank the other day, and they're guaranteeing my deposits up now at, uh, up to, um, what is it up to now? Something absurd. $250,000. That doesn't mean they have $250,000 sitting in there for me to take whenever I want to. And if every depositor came in at once, the bank would immediately go belly up. And the FDIC certainly can't support those kind of guarantees. In other words, there's like unbelievable ambiguity about national money. I mean, nobody actually knows who owns what, where the claims are. Not all the claims can be met. There's no chance. Bitcoin completely reverses that. Um, it's real property. There's no double spending, and that's its, its great merit. It restores the idea of property rights 
uh, to money, which we haven't seen in, in hundreds of years. Okay, we only have like a minute. We only have like a minute or so. So short very answers. Quick question. Great lecture, Mr. Tucker. Okay. Uh, question is the even after seventy one we went off, and yeah. you could argue in seventy three it turned to a petrol dollar uh, or a surface there missile commodity backed dollar. Uh, they're clearly not going to give up the monetary monopoly no. easily. So even if they could regulate and tax Bitcoin, will that be enough? Or they can't create, they can't create well, credit expansion? Is there a chance they outlaw it one day and it just turns into a black market economy? Uh, I don't think the Bitcoin can be outlawed. Uh, Good. And I don't, Good. I don't, I don't, I don't think they're, they can attempt, they won't attempt that because it won't work. Why do you, yeah. why do you think uh, that some of these oh so humble economists not embrace other competing currencies? Because intelle might? intellectuals are uh, just filled with arrogance and, Good. and they believe they know everything and they don't. They don't. Hi, Markets Jeffrey. are smarter than intellectuals. Okay. Yeah. Hi Jeffrey, how are you doing? This is Rado here. Yeah. How do you achieve your stratospheric levels of cool? <laughs> Um, I own Dogecoin. Okay, <laughs> good. Perfect. <laughs> Jeffrey, there seems to be a bias in the general public in terms of broad adoption of Bitcoin. I was trying to explain Bitcoin to someone recently. She was sincerely interested. I was answering all her questions. Yeah. I got frustrated. I finally said, if there was a country in the South Pacific called Bit, and the use of money called Bitcoin, this, this discussion would be over. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, but look, you know, things, things like Bitcoin are always adopted by an elite first. You should not feel bad here, but you are an elite. It was true with electricity. You know, in the late, not late 19th century, the first homes that got it, they were all owned by the robber barons and, you know, the smartest classes and people who were willing to take, step out there and take those big risks. But okay, in, guys. Time, in time, it's going to be universal. I, I'm, I'm sorry to be a Nazi, but there's five tracks. Guys, uh, a hand for uh, Mr. Cocker here.